Uh, welcome to this public meeting um, with the Department Standing Committee on Social Development, uh, brief on junior kindergarten implementation with the Honorable Alfred Moses, Minister of Education, Culture, and Employment. Before we proceed, Mr. O'Reilly, will you open us up with a prayer, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If you wish to experience peace, provide peace for another. If you wish to know you are safe, cause another to know that they are safe. If you wish to understand seemingly incomprehensible things, help another to understand. If you wish to heal your own sadness or anger, seek to heal the sadness or anger of another. The Dalai Lama. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Riley. Um, before we uh, introduce ourselves and that, I'd like to welcome the public to this meeting. Um, Please be advised this is a public meeting and the minister is going to give us a briefing on junior kindergarten. Um, there will be some opportunities to address Bill 16 future, in the future, but right now we're just going to focus on the presentation from the minister and his staff. At this point in time, uh, can, I'll start with Mr. Blake to introduce himself. Good afternoon, Frederick Blake, MLA for Mackenzie Delta. Welcome. <coughs> Good afternoon, I'm, uh, Tom Bully, MLA for Trinidad and Willoughby. Good afternoon, um, my name is Michael Nelde, MLA for Dechul. Welcome. Julie Green from Yellow Lake Centre. Hello. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. <coughs> Hi, thank you and welcome. My name is Corey Vanthine, MLA for Yellow Knife North. <coughs> Uh, Karen Kesshart has just stepped out of the room for a sec here. I would also like to introduce uh, Megan Welsh, uh, our research researcher, and Doug Showery, who is handing out uh, some papers right now, as our clerk. <clears throat> I'm Shane Thompson um, from the Handy. Ms. Minister Moses, uh, I will turn it over to you to do opening statements and introduce your staff and then we can go on to the presentation. Thank you, Minister Moses. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, good afternoon committee members, uh, staff and, and the public. Uh, very pleased to be here today to discuss the implementation of junior kindergarten in the remaining Northwest Territories communities beginning in the 2017-2018 uh, school year and how it will be funded on an ongoing basis as part of the regular school funding formula. Today with me, I have Mr. Olin Lovely, Assistant Deputy Minister of Corporate Services, Ms. Rita Mueller, Assistant Deputy Minister for Education and Culture, Ms. Shelley Capralian, Director of Early Childhood Development and Learning, Julia Mott, Senior Advisor to the Deputy Minister, and Maya Lepage, my Ministerial Special Advisor. Two key priorities of this assembly are to support quality early childhood development and improve educational outcomes. The Department of Education, Culture and Employment, in collaboration with our divisional education councils and district education authorities, is working towards these goals in the introduction of junior kindergarten in all remaining communities this September for the 2017-2018 school year and beyond. Mr. Chair. Prior to introducing junior kindergarten, staff engaged with key stakeholders from across the territory to hear their concerns and suggestions on how to best approach the implementation. We heard that while everyone believed the JK program was the right thing to do, stakeholders were concerned that it was not fully funded. In response, and as part of the budget we are currently reviewing, the government has committed to beginning in the 2017-18 school year, fully funding the final rollout of junior kindergarten in the remaining 13 communities across the Northwest Territories, providing $3.37 million to assist with play-based learning resources for all JK classrooms and to make appropriate infrastructure changes in schools where they are required. District education authorities will decide whether to offer JK as a half-day program or a full-day program so as to complement other early childhood programs in the communities. 
The Department has also provided increases to early childhood program operating subsidies to mitigate any impact on licensed early childhood programs should they have fewer four-year-old children in the programs as a result of junior kindergarten. <clears throat> District education authorities will have the option of having junior kindergarten taught by either a qualified teacher holding a Bachelor of Education degree or by an individual who has a two-year diploma in early childhood development from an accredited post-secondary program. I've heard members ex express some concerns about how children with special needs will be supported. Mr. Chair, children with special needs entering junior kindergarten will have full access to all existing school supports, as well as to the range of programs and services provided by the Department of Health and Social Services. Mr. Chair, I'm also pleased to advi advise members that this free play-based program will provide families in all NWT communities who choose to send their child to JK the economic benefit of saving up to $12,000 a year in childcare fees while providing their child with a quality early learning program. Mr. Chair, now with your permission, I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to uh, Assistant Deputy Minister, Mr. Olin Lovely, who will provide you with the presentation that describes in detail junior kindergarten implementation and ongoing funding. And at the uh, conclusion of the presentation, we'll be happy to answer uh, any questions that uh, committee members might have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Minister Moses. Mr. Lovell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, will just uh, turn to slide two here. This will provide you with an overview of what uh, this presentation will go over, um, the funding of the education system, delivery of junior kindergarten, inclusive schooling, Aboriginal language and culture-based education, uh, student transportation or busing, after-school programming, infrastructure, and uh, what we're planning on doing for uh, communications. So if we move to the next slide, uh, it's, this is the funding of the education system. Um, the GNWT establishes the amount of funding for public education annually using the school funding formula to allocate these funds to education authorities. Uh, the funding formula provides financial resources for the operation of the JK through grade 12 system by using enrollment data and average teacher salaries collected from schools and applying the information to the formula to ensure equitable allocation across the NWT. This will also take into account the fact that the cost of doing business in small and remote communities is significantly higher than doing that in Yellowknife, so there is uh, adjustment factors for community location as well. In any given year, funding to education authorities is based on enrollments. As a result, um, the authorities are required to manage their staffing complement on a yearly basis because as enrollment goes up, the funding for the amount of teachers will go up. As enrollment goes down, the funding for the amount of teachers will go down. Uh, so the next slide here uh, speaks to the delivery of junior kindergarten. Uh, again, as we have mentioned previously, the implementation of junior kindergarten in the remaining 13 communities in the Northwest Territories is expected to cost $5.1 million. This amount, as, as mentioned, was, is, is fully funded. Uh, the original rollout in 19 and now 20 communities with the addition of Saks Harbor uh, costs approximately $1 million. This amount was funded through an internal reallocation in, uh, through the staffing table uh, changes. The GNWT will also be providing additional one-time costs uh, for the purchase of play-based equipment and resources to support the expansion to deliver to the JK program. And uh, as well, we'll be undertaking any renovations that are required uh, to provide the JK program in the uh, existing schools. Um, we have provided the education authorities with the total funding that we will be providing to them in the 17-18 school year. This will include the $5.1 million that was announced. Education authorities will be expected to budget to this revised figure. Again, as I mentioned previously on the next slide, uh, the school funding formula is based largely on two factors. The first one is enrollment. And uh, so the cost of junior kindergarten is very dependent on what the enrollment numbers are going to be. Uh, the 2017-8 contribution amount is based on enrollments 
that were finalized September 30th, 2016. Uh, what we see uh, is that the enrollment has increased from 8,116 students in 2015-16 to 8,642 students, approximately uh, 526 new students uh, across the system. 447 of those are, are junior kindergarten students. In those communities where we have junior kindergarten already uh, operating, the enrollment is based on what the actual numbers are. In the communities where there is no junior kindergarten, in the remaining 13 communities, it's based on 90% of the kindergarten enrollments. We also have 79 new students that are in the system as a result of just natural enrollment growth. Um, that cost is currently being uh, funded internally, but we'll be coming back at some point to uh, find the additional resources to cover that cost off. If during the course of the year in 1718, schools find that uh, their enrollment has increased and they are required to um, staff new positions um, because of uh, that. We do provide extraordinary enrollment after uh, enrollments are finalized on September 30th. So if the community <coughs> enrollment increases by 8% or more and there's at least 10 new students as a result of that, we'll provide that extra funding. Uh, the next slide here is just a visual represent, a graphic representation of what the enrollments are looking like um, for 17-18. So, you know, we have a region like the HO where the enrollments have dropped by 28 and to one where in YK1 our enrollments are going up by uh, 210. That's large, the 210 is largely a result of uh, the junior kindergarten enrollments. If you move on to the next slide, uh, this is the other factor of the funding formula and that's the average salary calculation. And we use the average salary as, um, that is based on the Education Authority staff positions as of October 1st of the prior year. And overall, there are about 725 posi teaching positions uh, across the north. Um, for all administration positions and UNW positions, of which there are about 370, the salary is funded at the midpoint step of the range that the position was evaluated at. So for these positions, there are eight steps in a pay range, and we will fund those positions at the fourth step, so at the midpoint. Education authorities also receive 21.75% on top of the salary to cover the employer portion of benefits. So when we look and examine at how other departments and agencies in the government are funded, they are largely funded at the midpoint of the pay range, and they are funded well below the 21.75%. <coughs> And the next uh, slide here just demonstrates that in any given year, the average salaries will go up and down uh, at the education authority level. So if we look at Beaufort Delta, uh, for example, there's approximately 110 teachers, and we are currently funding them at about $128,700 per teacher. But what they're actually incurring as a cost is 126,000 per position. So for this year, they will be able to um, use those resources as a key fit or set it aside for um, future requirements for when this teacher salaries do go up. If we move on to the next uh, slide, this slide you'll be uh, familiar with. Um, this is just what the overall cost for junior kindergarten is gonna be. Um, the first column is uh, by education authority the ongoing cost for the delivery of junior kindergarten. And as I mentioned previously, we have stuck with the $5.1 million because as we, as we progress through every year, the cost for junior kindergarten will be different. The one-time cost is the $15,000 we'll be providing per classroom for play-based equipment. So in YK1, we're estimating approximately um, four new classrooms. So that is four times 15,000 or $60,000. As a result of the, uh, the funding of junior kindergarten, we're gonna see approximately 37 and a half new funded teachers across the NWT for those 447 new students. Um, the next slide uh, is a discussion around inclusive schooling. And under the Education Act, the department is required to fund inclusive schooling at 15% of the overall contributions provided to education authorities. 
We are currently funding education authorities at 17.1%, which is significantly higher than what we're required to by legislation. Uh, however, children entering JK will have access to existing supports and resources within the school. The specific needs of JK students will be met through school-based support teams that we already have in place. JK students are also funded at a student-teacher ratio of 12 to 1, which takes into account the increased support that this student population may need. In order to accommodate concerns associated with inclusive schooling, the department has also put on hold the full implementation of the inclusive schooling ministerial directive. This means we have delayed the hiring of a team of specialists. And what this means is that instead of using $1.3 million to hire those specialists and um, the associated training dollars with them, we're going to use this and keep it within the system and fully fund the inclusive schooling for the existing K-12 through system. In terms of Aboriginal language and culture-based education, um, this is the next slide. JK students are being added to the system and will have access to all the school ALCBE programming, just like any other student in that school. JK students will benefit from the whole school programming that celebrates Aboriginal languages and culture, which integrates the foundational documents of Denikete and Inakatagat as the Aboriginal way of teaching and learning. Um, in terms of student transportation or busing, uh, there is a component within the school funding formula that is calculated based on the number of students, the average school size, the community distance factor, and the living, living cost differential. Um, what we have below is the formula, and I won't go into that in detail, but when we do add the JK students, the funding amount for busing does go up. Uh, we also have some exceptional um, exceptionalities out there in terms of uh, DEDA, Betchco, Enterprise, and Hay River Reserve, where those communities have to bus their children to another location outside of their existing community. <laughs> As mentioned previously, the funding formula is a funding allocation tool. It is not a tool for adequacy of funding. So historically, um, the cost of busing has exceeded the funding that we have provided uh, through the formula. However, education authorities do have the discretion to reallocate within that total pot that we provide them to be able to meet the needs that they have for the delivery of their educational programming. We do recognize that busing of younger students will likely mean more, express, uh, more expensive transportation costs. And as a result, we are working with the education authorities to review the formula to see if there's perhaps a better way of, of allocating um, funding for that. After school programming, on the next slide, um, we do provide funding to license after school <coughs> program providers through the Early Childhood Program Funding Program. Uh, we have also increased the uh, early childhood program attendance-based funding rates, and that was effective October 1st, 2016. Um, and this funding is intended to offset the costs for operating these programs. Parents, however, are also expected sometimes to pay a user fee. And uh, the type of after-school program avail available will depend on the community needs and programming available. For example, the YWCA in Yellowknife is an example of a program that is considering expansion of the program to include four-year-olds. So four-year-old children in junior kindergarten are considered school-age children under the NWT Child Daycare Act, and the ratios for those children under the Act will apply. What this means is that the ratio for school-age children is 1 to 10, as opposed to under the Daycare Act where it's 1 to 9. Um, the department's early childhood consultants will work with the programs to ensure that younger children are grouped in settings that are age appropriate to ensure the safety of all children. Uh, infrastructure funding, on the next slide, um, the department has completed a survey of the requirements for infrastructure changes to schools to accommodate four-year-old children. Um, what we're planning to do is to undertake the renovations over the course of the next three fiscal years. Uh, and the highest priority will be given to those areas that are deemed to be a requirement to help deliver the program. So smaller bathrooms, uh, any renovations to classrooms to help accommodate the uh, smaller size of these children. 
So as we near the implementation of these renovations and refine the scope of the various projects, our estimates will change. But currently right now what we're seeing is approximately $3.1 million in additional cost uh, to accommodate the changes that we have identified. And we will seek this funding through the normal capital planning process. So we will be coming before the standing committee as well at the appropriate time to uh, discuss this. Uh, the next slide just shows uh, right now what we have planned. Again, if something um, comes up that is a high priority, we will adjust accordingly. But uh, as it stands right now, uh, what we have planned in 2017-18 and the following two years are identified in the chart on this uh, slide. Finally, under the uh, last two slides, we're talking about uh, communications. So. Under the first phase of communications, we focused on partner and stakeholder engagements, and we worked with uh, the DECs, the DEAs, the Early Childhood Program Operators, and the NWTTA. Partners and stakeholders received the full package of JK information in both English and French, and this included our presentation, fact sheets, questions and answers, information booklets, and hotline information. We also uh, conducted a series of engagements with communities on implementation between May and December of 2016. Our next phase of communications will be at the community level. So what we're going to do for parents, caregivers, educators, and the general public include uh, making sure that our website has all the research, pertinent articles, supporting publications, resources, and hotline information so that parents can access our parents and stakeholders can access that information readily. We're also going to have uh, social media and theater um, advertisements uh, with a day in JK video that will be coming out shortly. We will have a toolkit for parents and caregivers. Uh, we'll have social media postings, radio and hotline information, and of course we'll continue our dialogue with all partners and stakeholders as we roll this out. So our final slide is uh, respect to um, training for JK and kindergarten teachers. Um, as a department, we continue with monthly webinars to address teachers' needs and provide regular opportunities for discussion and collaboration. To date, some topics have focused on <coughs> play-based learning, assessment and reporting, indigenizing education, and the early childhood development instrument. Current teachers across the North will be provided training on Tuesday, May 16th through Friday, May 19th in Yellowknife. New teachers hired for the 17-18 school year across the NWT will be provided training in the fall of 2017 in Yellowknife. This training is intended to capture new employees and those who cannot attend the training that we did provide in May. All these costs, all these training costs will be covered by the department. Regional specific training will be provided upon a request by the education authorities and we will also be conducting training on the appropriate and consistent use of the Early Childhood Development Instrument tool for all JK and K staff, and that will also be provided in the fall of 2017 in uh, That concludes our presentation, and um, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Lovely. Uh, Mr. Bolio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman. On slide number three, the original rollout of 19 communities cost approximately $1 million. This amount was funded through a reduction in staffing tables. Could I get the department to advise us what staffing tables they're referring to? Okay, thank you, Mr. Bolio. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Moses. Mr. Lovely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Under the school funding formula, there is an allocation of teachers for every grouping of children. So for 100 students, uh, we would have 9.53 uh, funded positions. So what we did instead is we rolled that back and said for 100 students, for example, um, is 9.5 funded positions. So we rolled the funding table back down. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lovely. Mr. Bully. Thank you. On um, I think slide I think it's slide five. On uh, the fifth slide, uh, you talk about for funding administration and positions UNW positions um, at midpoint. Um, <coughs> is there um, an opportunity or intent to 
uh, retroactively adjust that to actuals uh, further on into the year? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moses. Thank you, Mr. Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, at this point in time, uh, no, there isn't. No. Mr. Moses. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your uh, presentation. It answers, it answers a lot of questions, but there are a few that are outstanding. Um, my first question uh, has to do with uh, slide number six, where there is uh, uptake on junior kindergarten. Can you tell me what proportion of the four-year-olds are? are enrolling in the, or their parents are enrolling them in the program? Like is it 75% of the four-year-olds or 100% or? Thank, thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, for, for some of the schools that have already started the enrollment process, so we don't have the exact numbers right now, but we can uh, get them for the number. But uh, as schools go through their uh, enrollments, uh, getting ready for the, uh, the fall time, we'll have a, a, a better number and uh, be able to look at uh, the, the funding models that we'll be working with the, uh, or the funding that we'll be giving to the education authorities. So we don't have those exact numbers right now in front of us, uh, but we can get them for the schools that have uh, started getting the four-year-olds in. Thank you. Minister Moses. Ms. Green. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm talking about the, the schools that have been providing junior kindergarten for a couple of years now uh, to get a sense of what proportion of the four-year-olds in the community take up the program. Is there any school that started offering junior kindergarten that has stopped offering junior kindergarten? Could you tell me about that, please? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's, there's, there has been some schools that initially, when we did the uh, initial rollout of junior kindergarten, that uh, started uh, the program but had stopped. Uh, in some cases, some, some communities that wanted to take the junior kindergarten program, there was no four-year-olds in the, in the communities. Uh, other areas might have dealt with some possible uh, resource issues that I think were really uh, identifying and addressing with the, uh, the funding that we got for um, play-based resources as well as making uh, uh, funding available for renovations as well as that uh, uh, 5.1 in terms of the operations of rolling out JK. Thank you. Minister Moses. Mr. O'Reilly. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. I want to compliment the uh, Minister and his department. This is the most complete answers we've seen. That's, I think we're uh, getting closer now. Um, Sorry, it's not numbered, but I think it's slide number five. The last bullet there says, if enrollment in a community increases by 8% or more, uh, and there's at least a 10 student increase, you're going to look at some extra midterm uh, year, mid-year funding. What's the rationale for the 8% uh, or 10 students? Um, shouldn't there just be an increase if the numbers don't jive, period? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, uh, Minister Moses. Sorry, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I personally don't know what the uh, the rationale behind that is, uh, but I will go to my ADM, and I think that uh, providing the funding mid-year for the extra teaching staff, uh, that the initial funding that we give to education authorities, they'd be able to offset that, and then we'd be able to. Uh, uh, address it midway through, but I will go to uh, my assistant DM for uh, further clarification as to the why the 8%. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moses, Ms. Mueller. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Minister. So it's just based on what we, we've always had in the formula right now. It's 8% or 10 students. Um, and the rationale behind that, and, and we, in fact, um, the extra, or it's called extraordinary funding, that funding uh, is applied um, every year. Uh, for schools, and in fact, um, if they do have more than 10 students that, that they anticipated uh, at the beginning of the year and or that makes up 8% uh, of their student population, the funding actually kicks in much sooner than halfway through the year because the reality is they, they very likely will need to hire another teacher, and that's the whole purpose of the extra ordinary funding. And so uh, we uh, look at the September 30th enrollment 
and um, it takes a, a few months to um, verify the exact enrollment, but usually that's verified uh, prior to Christmas or very early in the new year. And uh, if they meet this requirement, they do get the extra ordinary funding immediately because they very likely will need staffing. And in fact, most education authorities have already hired that staff uh, to meet the needs, and then they, uh, they get the funding for it. Really. Thanks. Okay. So that's just the way it works across the uh, system. Um, um, I want to go to another slide here about uh, Aboriginal language. If I can find it now. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Sorry, it's unnumbered. Uh, so you're you're saying there that there's the whole school programming funding that's made available, that's great. Um, but the fact is there's gonna be additional students. <laughs> so you're asking to the, the, uh, the, school, uh, the schools to deliver the same uh, additional programming uh, in a new classroom, maybe, uh, or part of a classroom, new kids with the same amount of funding. How does this funding work? Is it based on enrollment or is it just a lump sum that's given to uh, school boards uh, to do things with? Uh, how, how's the funding work? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, initially, with the funding, majority of that funding goes to uh, uh, funding that's spent on hiring Aboriginal language uh, instructors. Uh, any other additional funding that uh, is left over uh, can go to items pertaining to language and culture based on activities uh, that are offered with the, with the programming. And with, with that in, in place with the uh, junior kindergarten students coming in, they'd be, have access to that culture and programming as well in the, uh, the school setting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, um, even a little bit more detail, maybe I'll ask uh, uh, Ms. Mueller to add a little bit more detail to that issue. Thank you, Minister. Ms. Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Minister. The Minister is correct in saying that uh, Aboriginal language and uh, culture funding does go to the education authorities. Um, it is based on, uh, on uh, student enrollment. Uh, however, uh, as the Minister alluded to, um, approximately 80% of that funding is really used uh, to hire Aboriginal language instructors for the school. The remaining amount is used for land-based activities, uh, usually school-wide uh, cultural uh, events, um, elders in school programming, a, a whole variety of programs that all, school, that all children in the school can access. That's often how it's, uh, how it's uh, programmed. Um, the other thing to note is that the play-based curriculum for our four and five-year-olds in the Northwest Territories is very much on the foundation that the uh, programming uh, needs to reflect the cultures of the students that it's serving. And so uh, it is based on the foundation of Denikade and Inikatakit, which is also what the rest of our school uh, programming is. And uh, students in that are four years old in junior kindergarten uh, will be playing um, they should be very actively engaged in all kinds of activities and a big focus for them is who they are, building up their self-esteem and really uh, taking pride in who they are, who their families are and, and their community. And so that's, that's instilled in the JK uh, curriculum. Mr. Nedley. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think my primary concern at this point and what, what I see in terms of the presentation brings clarity in terms of this major initiative and it's, 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 it's good to see that. And um, however, um, you know, there's no mention of Aboriginal Head Start. Um, I'm kind of looking for perhaps uh, reassurance that uh, perhaps the department has gone out and reached an understanding in terms of primarily uh, Aboriginal Head Start students that are four year old. And Aboriginal Head Start, of course, has a different philosophy in terms of teaching the students. And I just wanted to ensure that there's consistency in terms of what we're teaching our kids in Aboriginal Head Start. And at the same time, you know, they're brought into the school and there's some consistency. So it, it's necessary that some communication happen between the two programs. Uh, perhaps maybe the minister could uh, shed light on that. Must see. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And 
and uh, with the onset and some of the concerns that were brought forth with the uh, Aboriginal Head Start program and staff, uh, our, our staff at the department have been engaging with Aboriginal Head Start managers, uh, staff in all the communities. I know we've done uh, trips into the communities. If it wasn't our staff, it was our regional offices that went and met uh, with schools, the, the eight communities that offer currently offer, offer Aboriginal Head Starts. Uh, also, any concerns that we have had from uh, leadership, we have sent letters to leadership to engage and consult and, and sit down with them. In some cases, we haven't heard back, uh, and we have been trying to follow up to uh, address those concerns. Uh, we did get a, a concern and have sat down and met with the, uh, uh, the Dene Nation uh, in terms of where they, they brought forth a, uh, a motion at their last assembly. Uh, we sat down and gave them a good uh, uh, update and information, and I think we both walked out of that meeting feeling feeling a lot better and where we're moving forward. Um, it, it also brings to the shed light that uh, with the rollout of junior kindergarten, the schools have the option of offering a half day or full time um, programming. Uh, two schools that we currently uh, work with where Aboriginal Head Start is also participating is in uh, Fort McPherson and uh, down here just down the road in, in Delo and we're seeing some really good uh, uh, positive results out of that in terms of the the uh, the program that's offered to the four-year-olds and as I said in my in my uh, opening comments that uh, families do have that option now where Aboriginal Head Start is happening that if they do half the junior kindergarten families have that opportunity to have full day quality early childhood programming offered to them uh, economically uh, it does save families in up to the amount of $12,000. Uh, but we are still engaging. Our staff has worked with staff of Aboriginal Head Start. Uh, we will continue. Uh, we invite them to all our, our training. Uh, we invite them to our symposium that's held annually in August, and uh, we'll continue to provide them financial with financial support as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Natalie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, the aim, I think, of the discussions is to have a level of coordination. I mean, what, would that be the intent of discussions with, and dialogue with the Aboriginal Head Start and ACA? I see. Thank you, Mr. Natalie. Minister Moses. I think definitely that would be a, a topic how we can coordinate, how we can work together, uh, build off the examples of uh, how things are working in Fort McPherson as well as down in Delo. We've been, been down to Delo and seen the program itself uh, roll out, and we're seeing some really good things there. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Moses. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to go back to the question um, that I, I just asked. Um, so of the 19 schools that introduced junior kindergarten, how many um, stopped offering it because they don't have four-year-olds and stopped offering it because they had resource issues? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Moses. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And uh, if anybody recalls back in the 17th Legislative Assembly when uh, we looked at rolling out junior kindergarten, we had an uptake of uh, 23 communities uh, that wanted to offer it. Uh, then, as I mentioned, some communities that wanted to offer the program didn't even have uh, four-year-olds. Uh, currently, uh, we're working with 19 communities that are currently offering the program, 20 with the, with the um, inclusion of Saks Harbor offering junior kindergarten uh, just this past uh, last month in January. So currently we have 20 communities that are offering uh, junior kindergarten programs uh, in their schools. And thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the answer. It's just lacking some detail on um, on the communities that stopped offering JK because of resource issues, I'm not sure how many communities that is. And I'm also not sure what happens to them. Are you going back to them with new resources to, to try and get them to uh, sign on? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and as mentioned, uh, our staff is reaching out to the, to the schools and working with the education authorities as well as the uh, education councils to look at uh, how we're going to be rolling this out. And those discussions are still happening right now, as uh, Olin mentioned, that uh, discussions around busing, for instance, uh, those are still kind of looking at how we, uh, the, the review of the formula. And um, any, any schools that stopped offering it, uh, obviously we did that review and report and looked at some of the 
uh, what, what the issues were for them not offering. Um, I will go to um, maybe my Assistant Deputy Minister, Ms. Mueller, to look at, to ask her for a little bit more detail. But within this budget that we have before us, currently before us in, in the session, that we do have that financial support now to offer schools uh, to fully implement junior kindergarten. Uh, thank, thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Mueller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Minister. So uh, um, in October of 2014, uh, until that time, we had uh, 23 communities that had uh, small, small communities um, uh, being um, funded to offer a junior kindergarten. Uh, what happened was there was three communities at that time that actually didn't have any four-year-olds, and so that was the case there, for example, in, uh, in um, Jean Marie River was one of those communities that intended to offer it. They, in fact, had a four-year-old uh, prior to school starting. The family moved out of the community. That's just one example. So there was three, three communities like that. Uh, since then, though, some of those communities do have four-year-olds and are part of the 20 that are offering it right now. Then there was uh, several communities when they were given the choice of continuing to offer uh, junior kindergarten in January 2015 while the review was taking place or to stop offering it. Uh, several of them did stop um, offering it. I believe it was three communities that stopped at that time. So the intention is that starting this, um, uh, this fall, the 17-18 school year, is that all the communities will be uh, offering junior kindergarten again, either on a half-time or full-time basis. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Ms. Ms. Green. Um, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that answer. Um, I want to ask a similar question to the one that my colleague asked about uh, Aboriginal language education, and that's about the effect of diluting the resources available for inclusive schooling by bringing in extra children. And that would particularly be the case in um, the Yellowknife schools where larger numbers of children are coming in. So uh, I appreciate that the resources belong to the school, but the demand for them will be greater. So how will the department offset that increased demand? Thank you. Mr. Minister Moses. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And with uh, the students that are coming into the school system, they'll have uh, access to, to all resources, uh, existing school supports, uh, the school principal program support teachers uh, with the inclusive schooling, uh, as mentioned in the House as we're rolling out the pilot. Uh, our, our goal is to have a program support teacher in every school uh, throughout the Northwest Territories, uh, other classroom teachers as well as regional inclusive school coordinators to, uh, to help with that. Uh, there is a focus uh, that the children that are coming in on junior kindergarten, that is play-based uh, uh, program, and that a lot of our students, as they develop, they develop through play and interaction, and uh, hopefully, and we're not expecting to see too much uh, of that uh, extra support that's needed. They'll have access to all the supports through the school system. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks. We seem to be following each other up here. but um, So yeah, let's go back to the, the, the Aboriginal language and culture funding. I believe I heard that you said that it's based on enrollment. So uh, will that enrollment uh, include the 90% figure for kids in kindergarten being counted as uh, uh, JK students for the purposes of the, the funding. That's the answer I guess I'm looking for. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you. As, uh, as my Assistant Deputy Minister uh, mentioned earlier, that the bulk of the funding goes to uh, an instructor. Uh, whatever any other funding that is, is available, goes to program for the whole school. It's not focused on any individual students or any individual classroom. It's going to be a program that's going to be offered to uh, all students that are in the, uh, in the school setting. And uh, so any, any funding through that program uh, will go into resources that can, can help promote language and culture. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Riley. Thanks, Mr. Chair. That's not an answer that I was looking for. <laughs> I think I heard you say, uh, or somebody say, that the uh, that funding is based on enrollment. So, will the enrollment for 2017-18 include junior kindergarten students or not? Period. 
I just want a yes or a no. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Because that gets to the issue of whether this is fully funded or not. O'Reilly. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And with the uh, new enrollments, much like any other, uh, I guess you say any other grade within the system, uh, JK will be part of the school system now, so that those enrollments will uh, result in extra funding, yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Minister Moses. Mr. Van Thuy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple of quick questions in and around inclusive schooling. Um, EDI right now is applied, I, I understand, and maybe this is the first question for clarification. EDI is applied to um, kindergarten, um, mostly five-year-olds. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and yes, that's correct. And uh, uh, we've done about five years of studies right now with that, that program, and uh, the results have been very helpful in us helping moving forward making decisions and sharing that with the uh, Department of Health and Social Services and some of the programs that they're uh, running as well. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Mr. Van Thuy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So is there going to be some intention maybe to uh, put the EDI questions to um, four-year-olds at JK so that we can, um, you know, at, try to make early as possible determinations on needs for inclusive schooling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Van Thuy. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, I believe so that we will be administering the uh, EDI to uh, four and five-year-olds to, well, obviously you want to get the best results so that we can make the best decisions for our most vulnerable, but also look at some of these, uh, how, how well is JK uh, working, providing our students. We did do a presentation here a while back where we did see uh, students that were entering the kindergarten system that went through the JK system uh, were more developmentally ready to get into the into kindergarten, or uh, compared to children that didn't have any access to uh, to any early childhood programming. Uh, maybe for a little bit more detail, I'll go to my assistant deputy minister, uh, Ms. Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Mueller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Minister. So it is, uh, it is the intention that um, the EDI uh, will be, that assessment tool that, that kindergarten teachers fill out will be filled out by both junior kindergarten and kindergarten teachers starting this uh, fall, and uh, as well uh, the training that accompanies that. And so um, every year our um, junior kindergarten teachers and kindergarten teachers are offered and uh, are required to take training uh, in order to use the tool. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. I'll just get a couple of questions before I move on to a couple of the, with my colleagues here. On that line. Okay, quickly. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Mr. Van Thuy. That's not how you I feel that I don't come here often enough. Um, Sorry for that. Uh, just one more quick question as it relates to the funding component of this. We've indicated in the presentation that under the Act, uh, we're obligated to put 15% of the annual contributions to, of the education authorities to inclusive schooling, but, but that we've actually been doing 17.1%. With the $5.1 million being uh, put towards um, to the authorities for supporting JK, is the number going to stay at 17.1%? Uh, as the amount that we're going to fund for inclusive schooling, seeing how the uh, overall pot is going up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Van Thuyen. It was one way, sorry, kind of one-way question, so that's good. Hey, uh, Minister Moses, I can read your mind. Yeah, yeah thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And the 17.1 uh, does include the, uh, the funding for junior kindergarten. As I, as I mentioned, uh, our staff's working with the education authorities in terms of the rollout, uh, the costs, how enrollment is going to look, and, and that's still uh, in the process of happening right now, and, and our staff is looking at every way we can support our education authorities for a smooth transition of junior kindergarten in the remainder of our 13 communities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Uh, just to follow up on the question, Mr. Van Thuyen, um, I noticed in this year's budget we're cutting $1.8 million or between $1.5 or $1.8 million from inclusive schooling. So is that part, when we do this 15% or 17.1%, does this conclude these, these cuts? Thank you, Ms. Minister Moses. Yeah. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, uh, it was a question that was brought up in committee of the whole when we th went through the main estimates, uh, and it was, uh, it was in the presentation here. Uh, Mr. Uh, Lovely had mentioned that uh, uh, we didn't have a chance to change the mains after having a meeting with all the uh, education, uh, the board chairs, as well as the uh, uh, superintendents. So uh, that, that money is back in for the uh, full implementation of uh, inclusive school. And that money was actually uh, what we were looking for to develop a support team to get out to the Northwest Territories. But uh, even for more detail, I'll go to uh, Mr. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Lovely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As the minister mentioned, uh, there was $1.8 million that was going to be used to fund a team of specialists and all the associated training that we would have. Um, again, as I had mentioned previously, that team of specialists is put on hold. So the $1.3 million, $1.3 million of that $1.8 is going back into inclusive schooling. We are still retaining $500,000 to be able to undertake the training that's required to help uh, with the inclusive schooling uh, directive. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lovely. Uh, my second question then is, uh, they were talking, you guys talked about uh, the PTS or PST teachers, and that was supposed to be in each school, and that was coming out of the wellness funding that was coming, that was taken out. And we weren't going to do the wellness funding for the specialist team, because this is what I heard in community home. Maybe I mis was misinformed when I didn't hear it correctly. But that was my understanding where the money was, so that the, the, the wellness fund was moved up, and what that was supposed to be where the, the that plus the money that was taken from inclusive schooling was supposed to make sure we have these teachers in place. So has that been changed? Is this new money? So I, I'm a little bit confused in the, the direction of how this was done. Thank you. Minister Moses. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll go to uh, my assistant deputy. Ms. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ms. Mueller. Moses. Ms. Mueller. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, Mr. Chair. So to clarify, Originally, as part of the rollout, the three-year rollout of the new inclusive schooling directive that uh, uh, came into effect this school year that we're currently in, uh, $1.8 million had been um, uh, estimated uh, for the following, to hire a territorial team of specialists to support uh, the schools when they're supporting children with special needs, and uh, approximately 500000 for the specific ongoing training of program support teachers. And the reason for that is, as part of our rollout for, with the inclusive schooling uh, directive, uh, again, beginning this school year over a three-year period, uh, the expectation will be that we will have a, a quite a, a large number of PSTs coming into our system, and they require very specialized training. And so, um, as the minister mentioned, 1.3 million that was um, allocated towards that territorial team of uh, student support specialists um, has been postponed. And for the 17-18 school year, that $1.3 million will be put back into the education authorities, allocated back to them. And the remaining $500,000 will be still retained at the department because uh, program support teachers need training in order to be highly effective. And so that that's, uh, explains that money, I hope. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, I'd like to know um, what will happen for the four-year-olds in schools where there is no um, third-party after-school program being offered, like the YWCA offers programming here in Yellowknife. If that doesn't exist, then what, what happens to the four-year-olds at the end of the school day? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Moore. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And those are the, the discussions, as uh, was mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation, that uh, our staff is working with the education authorities and the schools uh, to look at the options for for that to, to move forward, whether there be an after-school program that meet, might be put in place or else uh, uh, working with the other um, possible uh, organizations to find some kind of uh, alternative. Um, I know that our staff has been working, as I mentioned, with the authorities. Uh, for some of that detail, maybe I'll ask Ms. Mueller if she'd like to uh, uh, speak to this part of how those discussions have been going. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Mueller. Um, so 
it really depends. And it'll look different uh, in every community. We actually have communities that don't have a great need for after school uh, uh, programming. Um, we, we, d we just don't in some of our smaller communities when children are done school, if they're not involved in extracurricular activities like sports teams or music or clubs or drumming, then they, they go home. For some communities, it's a high, high demand like here in Yellowknife and some of our regional centres where before and after school is needed. We're also the department uh, uh, responsible for licensed early childhood programs and uh, uh, we do provide funding for uh, licensed early childhood programs that, that to have before and after school care, uh, but really the education authorities, um, and uh, they've been saying this in their uh, meetings with parents, they really, once they have a better sense of how many parents will require um, any kind of uh, before or after school care, uh, then the education authorities will look to see, you know, um, if uh, they are able to uh, provide uh, through partnership with other uh, organizations or early childhood programs, uh, those, that kind of uh, programming for parents. But it really will look different uh, each community. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So where after school care is provided, who will pay for that? Thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Moses. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, currently, our department doesn't pay for uh, current after school care. Uh, however, we do have uh, startup costs for daycares and day homes. And I think that's something that needs to be, uh, uh, or daycares, that needs to be addressed. I know uh, uh, we have some members here where we've been working with the communities to, to work on getting daycares in their, in their communities. And we do have great programs that help uh, communities start that up. So it might be, might provide a good opportunity for uh, someone in the community to, to set up a business or, or work in that area. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just, uh, this is the uh, student transportation slide. The last bullet there talks about how the department is working with education authorities on a formula. Um, and this probably really is more of an issue for the regional centers. Um, but can I get a commitment out of the minister that uh, um, if the, the concept here is that this is really truly going to be fully funded, that, uh, that the, if there's additional costs for busing the JK students, that the department is going to cover this. I want that clear commitment on the record, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. At this moment, I can't make that clear commitment for the extra busing, but I can uh, ask maybe Mr. Lovely how the, uh, the discussions have been going with the education authorities moving forward. Uh, as, he, as you uh, heard in his presentation, that uh, they're still working with the authorities to address and review the formula. So without any kind of, uh, without having that review in front of us, we can't uh, uh, make a commitment, but maybe I can ask uh, Mr. Lovely, just give us a little update on how those uh, uh, meetings have been going. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Moses, Mr. Lovely. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, currently what we are doing at the department is collecting the information on how much busing is, going, is currently costing as opposed to how much uh, the funding is that we provide. And then we want to get an understanding of how we are going to um, bus younger children, uh, four-year-old children uh, across the north and what those costs are going to be. And right now we don't have a full picture from everybody on what those costs are going to be. I just want to reiterate the point that when we talk about funding of junior kindergarten, it's about the funding through the formula. So, and as I mentioned before, the formula is an allocation tool. So when we say that the cost of junior kindergarten is going to be 5.1, it's we add in the 447 junior kindergarten students and see what that additional cost is going to be. It comes to 5.1. It's not a measure of whether or not the funding is adequate. So that's a different discussion than, than what this presentation is, is giving. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lovely. Mr. Blake. Oh. Sorry, I thought you had to, sorry, Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I guess we're on different planets here about whether this is fully funded then or not. Um, look, if, uh, if uh, the department's uh, concept of fully funded is according to the existing formula versus the additional cost of actually offering the program, those are two different things. And you cannot say that this is fully funded 
uh, you cannot be out there in public saying that this is fully funded if this issue is not addressed, uh, particularly busing and, and the extra costs and so on. So, sorry, Mr. Chair, I just had to say that. I want to go back, though, to um, inclusive schooling, um, the funding. So we're taking the $1.3 million and keeping it uh, in there, or one point whatever it is. So what, what are the implications for um, our uh, implementation of the Education Renewal Initiative? That's being delayed because of uh, moving the, the inclusive funding around? Is, is that what's happening? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Moses. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, and, and no, there's going to be no delays. Uh, as I mentioned in uh, previous presentations to the Standing Committee, that uh, we do have a lot of pilots out there that we're working on right now. Uh, the ministerial directive is something that we're focusing on so that we ensure that the uh, dollars that we put into inclusive schooling are actually getting to the, the needs of the children that, that do, in fact, need that uh, extra support to succeed and we get better outcomes. Uh, but we do have a lot of pilots out there with the education renewal right now that are working very well, and uh, we're going to continue to uh, uh, move forward in the education renewal. And I do believe, uh, as I mentioned in a previous presentation, that we are going to be giving a, a more thorough update on the education renewal uh, initiatives, uh, I believe, next week sometime. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of quick questions. Uh, what was the change to the mandatory rollout, uh, JK? I know in some of our briefings you mentioned that uh, some communities could decide not to offer it, but uh, what was the change to making it sort of a mandatory rollout? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. As Minister responsible for uh, education, culture, and employment, uh, I can't pick and choose where we, we put programs and services. Uh, this was a pilot, and we're getting to the, uh, the end of the pilot, plus we're looking at the, the, the review of uh, junior kindergarten, obviously those eight recommendations. Uh, we looked at them. We, we were addressing all of the, uh, the recommendations. And at some point, we've got to make sure that uh, as, as Minister, we take that responsibility to provide the programs and services to all residents of the NWT. All communities should have that opportunity for early uh, childhood, quality early childhood uh, programming, and, and that's where the changes we need to uh, implement that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Minister Moses. Mr. Blake. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Next is, I'm sure you're well aware of the concerns in Inuvik, but uh, what, what's the plans for places like the Children First Society, which really depend on uh, the four-year-olds <coughs> to keep their operation operating? Uh, thank you. Thank you Mr. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Children's First uh, Center and uh, Society, we've always been a big funder, probably, probably their, their main source of funding for them to keep their doors open as well as uh, providing them funding so that they can provide the program services to, uh, uh, to, to their, their infants and, and their clientele. Uh, still got to uh, remember that junior kindergarten is going to be optional for the, uh, the parent. So it's going to be really the decision for the families and the parent whether they send their, their four-year-olds into the uh, junior kindergarten program or keep them with uh, Children's First Center. Uh, so we're continuing to work with all our, our stakeholders. We've been engaging with uh, day, day home, daycare op operators as well, early childhood program operators. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I, I, I want to point out an important inconsistency uh, here in the Minister's messaging. The Minister has been saying um, consistently that this is a free program. But unless parents currently have children in daycare, to uh, have them in after-school care and to have them in professional development uh, days, coverage for professional development days, the families are going to be out of pocket in the order of about $350 a month. Um, the YWCA charges $280 a month now for after-school care and, and about $40 a day for um, professional development days. So if your kids are at home now and uh, you're at home too, no problem. 
But if you're a working family, which is usually the case in Yellowknife because of the cost of living, you will be, yes, accessing a program that there is no charge for, but yes, also on the hook for about $350 uh, per child per month in additional care costs. So, um, I, I, yeah, I, I guess my request is can you please adjust, adjust your messaging to take that into account? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Moses. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I, I just want to point out uh, something that was uh, mentioned in my opening uh, remarks and something that we've also said uh, in the House is that uh, currently any, anybody that goes into uh, uh, daycare, it'll, economically, it will save uh, families up to $12,000. So after school charges would be significantly less than that than what they were paying for the uh, full daycare or full day home daycare operations that a family might have to pay for their four year olds. Uh, so those costs for after school care compared to full day early childhood program, there's gonna be a significant decrease for those families. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moses. Ms. Green. Um, if the family is not working, uh, they are now gonna be assuming an additional cost. And the additional cost is $350 per child per month. So they're not saving $12,000 a year. They're, they have their four-year-old at home. Now they're going into the, the free optional play-based program and they're taking on $350 a month of uh, additional costs so that um, they, they, are, uh, they have this coverage for after school and professional development. So isn't it a bit disingenuous to say that this is a free program? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So if the family's not working, uh, I'd, uh, I'd imagine that they'd be at home. So then the uh, child can go home after, the, uh, after they have that, uh, that option to go to uh, uh, junior kindergarten, which is free play-based, and they, they, they get focused and, and work on the, uh, the developmental, uh, I guess, enhancements and, and be able to... Uh, uh, get developmentally ready for the uh, for kindergarten. So it works as a bonus for this the uh, family that's not working that they're now getting free play-based early childhood quality education and developmental readiness before kindergarten. And as, uh, as I mentioned, if they're not working, I'm, I'm assuming that the family be home and after uh, junior kindergarten, whether it's half day or full day, that the child would just go, go home. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Moulis. Being ref respectful of the time, um, we're going to probably have to call this meeting to a close. Um, Minister Moses, there are probably going to be a number of other uh, questions that the committee will be sending to you, um, and you can hopefully be able to answer them in a letter back to us, and then we will and we'll share it with the public, if that's all right with the minister. Minister Moses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and yes, any feedback, any comments, uh, any suggestions, anything that you think uh, would help us, we'd appreciate that, that feedback, uh, and uh, look forward to whether or not the uh, committee does take the uh, Bill 16 on the road and what, what they're hearing from the communities. Uh, in the 20 communities where we are offering junior kindergarten, we're seeing some excellent results. We're getting some good feedback from teachers, from parents, and uh, and with the rollout, uh, fully rollout of implementation uh, throughout the Northwest Territories, we're getting some good feedback as well uh, from families, double income families, where they're going to be able to save a little bit more dollars in their pocket as well. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the, uh, the time and uh, the questions here today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Moses. I thank you, Mr. Lovely and Ms. Mueller, and for all the audiences for attending this public hearing or public meeting, sorry, and it's not a hearing, it's a public hear a meeting, sorry. And uh, as uh, the minister said, uh, we will be discussing Bill 16 and we encourage uh, the general public to make submissions to us as well, to the, the department as well. So um, I thank you everybody for coming and at this point in time, I'd like to call the meeting to a close.